Good evening, everybody. Welcome. So good to see so many of you here with us this evening um, for what is going to be a fascinating conversation, I promise you. I'm Jennifer LaRue, delighted to be hosting this program tonight on behalf of the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. And it's really a thrill to see so many people from all over the place tuning in to take part tonight. So please, yes, please uh, keep ch chiming in in the chat. Let us know where you're from. Uh, anything else you want us to know about you? Um, and um, that's part of the fun of these virtual programs. Uh, before uh, I introduce my guests, I have just a little bit of housekeeping to do, including just another word about the chat. So yes, please keep chatting. Uh, tonight's program, like almost all of our virtual programs, is being recorded and you can uh, watch it again anytime you like, pretty much the moment it's over, just by following the same link uh, that you used to get here or by visiting marktwainhouse.org and looking for the virtual programs. Um, however, if you, um, well, not, this is not a however, I'm sorry. Uh, if, if you're chatting along and, and during the talk, you like start a conversation that you want to continue or you meet somebody interesting, um, know that uh, the chat remains live in perpetuity. So while the program um, is recorded, the chat just keeps on going. So you can always come back and chat some more about Teddy Roosevelt, um, which I'm sure you all have a lot to say about. Um, it, tonight though, it's, toward the end of the program, we are going to do a Q&A session. And if you could do us the favor of posting your questions rather than putting them in the chat, if you could put them down at the bottom of the screen where you see the words, ask a question, that makes it a lot easier for us to manage that portion of the program. And it also um, gives you the chance to look at questions other people have posed. And if you have the same one, you can upvote it and that moves it up to the top of the pile. So um, please uh, bear that in mind as we move through the program, uh, post your questions and we'll get to them toward the end. Uh, while you're gazing at that portion of the screen, if I could ask you just to raise your gaze a tiny bit to that long green bar that says your support is vital. Click here to donate to the Mark Twain House and Museum. Uh, that is a true statement. Your support is vital. The museum has been really delighted to be offering uh, these virtual programs nearly since the very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, in fact, a couple, it's getting close to two years since our, our very first uh, virtual program. And uh, since that time, the museum has offered as many, sometimes as three or four or more programs uh, virtually uh, a week. Um, and almost never does the museum charge any kind of registration fee or admission for these programs, but do know that they have not been free for the museum to mount. There are a lot of costs associated with doing this kind of thing, as I know you well imagine. So that if you have enjoyed uh, the museum's programs to date, if this is your first one and you're really uh, a fan as of tonight, um, or any other reason that you'd like to help support this effort, please take a moment if you can and are able to uh, click that button and make a donation of any size. And I promise you on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the staff of the Mark Twain House and Museum, every single penny that you donate is put to very, very good use and every single penny is very deeply appreciated. So thank you for that. Uh, speaking of thank yous, I really like to thank our sponsors. Uh, tonight's program, like all of the virtual programs, is sponsored by the Wish You Well Foundation and by our media sponsor, Connecticut Public, WNPR. And it's produced in part with support honoring the legacy of Frank Lord. Frank was a beloved trustee of the museum who passed away last year. And I think he'd be really thrilled at the work uh, that's being done here. And the museum is very delighted and honored to honor his memory through offering these programs. To learn more about other programs that are coming up, and I'm going to say programs generally, because in addition to continuing to offer uh, virtual programs over the next com coming months, um, the museum is dipping its toe in a big way back into live and in-person events. So please check the website, which is marktwainhouse.org and check out the upcoming um, in-person and virtual programs. So I'd like to draw your attention again to the chat to the very top. And I, I think my colleague Jacques will probably repost it for me if I ask him nicely, um, the link through which you could purchase your very own signed copy of tonight's book, Forging a President, How the Wild West Created Teddy Roosevelt by William Hazelgrove. Uh, and I did say a signed copy. Now we're no dummies. We know that you can purchase this book elsewhere, but you don't generally don't get a signed copy if you do that. 
And beyond that, uh, know that if you do purchase the book through clicking that link, your purchase supports the Mark Twain House and Museum. And again, that support is very much valued and, and appreciated. So our moderator tonight, as so often is the case with these um, programs that involve historical figures, particularly presidents, uh, she's uh, pretty much an expert on the president of the United States. Mallory Howard is back with us. She's the assistant curator of the Mark Twain House and Museum. Um, and she's going to be in conversation tonight with William Hazel Grove, who is returning to the Twain House in a virtual sense. Uh, he was here earlier to talk about 60 Minutes, The Race to Save the Titanic, a book he talked about just a few months ago. He's a national best-selling author of 10 novels and seven nonfiction titles. His books have received starred reviews in Publishers Weekly, Kirkus, book list, and many, many other places. Uh, he was the Ernest Hemingway writer in residence, where he wrote in the attic of Ernest Hemingway's birthplace. Um, and I could go on and on. His full bio is in the um, information about the, this program that you might have seen when you registered. So rather than take your time now away from listening to our guests speak, I'm going to introduce them and give me just a moment to bring them both on screen and help me welcome in a big Mark Twain house way William Hazelgrove and Mallory Howard. Ah, Mallory, where'd she go? Okay. There she is. There you go. So sorry about that. Welcome, William. Welcome, Mallory. Thank you for being here tonight. Thanks for having us. Very excited. Yeah, thank you. So excited to have you. So, Mallory, when it comes time for the Q&A, would you like to invite me back up to help with that part of things? I sure will. All right. Thank you. I'll see you in a little bit, and I'm going to sit back and enjoy like everybody else. Well, William, thank you so much for joining us again for another fascinating discussion about a wonderful historic topic. And I have to say, I really loved the book. I found it endlessly interesting and fascinating. And that sort of leads me into my very first question, which is of so many topics out there you can choose from. Why were you drawn to Teddy Roosevelt? Oh, well, um, well, thanks for having me. Um, you know, Teddy is a, a very, very big uh, figure. And um, what I do in a lot of my books, going all the way back to Madam President, The Secret Presidency of Edith Wilson, is basically I try and get under history to find some part that maybe you haven't heard. And, you know, since TR has been covered by so many people, um, I was actually reading a biography of uh, Edmund Morris's, and this is where I get a lot of my ideas from actually, you know, big biographies of other people. And uh, he talked about when he went west, and he went over it very quickly. And, you know, most biographies sort of treat this almost like an outward bound trip. Um, but I got fascinated with that. And then when I I found out that, um, and of course, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about all this, that his mother and wife died on the same day. And then he ended up going into the Badlands for three years with no return date. Uh, that to me seemed very pivotal. And then again, I, I don't I want to steal our thunder and throw everything out in the first <laughs> lines, but um, I, you know, he, he was a very, very sickly boy, of course. And we'll talk about that, but you know, this, made Teddy Roosevelt. And the name of my book is Forging a President and How the Wild West Created Teddy Roosevelt. But that's because it's my thesis that his experience out West created the TR, the Teddy Roosevelt that we know today, that, um, you know, the barrel chest of Teddy Roosevelt was created in the, in the badlands of the, the Wild West. And, you know, it's funny you mention um, talking about some of the tragedy that he ended up going through. And I, I do want to ask about that. But the mm. first thing uh, that I want to talk about diving a little bit further into it is most people, when they think about Teddy Roosevelt, they think of him as the rough rider and this very strong commanding presence. And I did not realize how truly sick and weak he was as a young boy. I mean, I was very surprised at, a lot of the illness that he was going through. Can you talk a little bit about that, about sure. some of the illness sure. and, that he was going through when he was younger? Yeah, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt uh, was born to a very rich family um, in New York. And so they had whatever medical science could offer at that time. But child mortality was high. Here's Teddy Roosevelt. He has severe asthma. I mean, 
the kind of asthma today where he would be on massive inhalers. Uh, and and he had uh, what we call Crohn's disease today. Uh, he couldn't keep anything down. He had constant digestive problems. He was small, weak. Uh, the doctors just did not think he was going to survive. I mean, you know, uh, somebody like Teddy Roosevelt mostly didn't survive. So, so what his father would do for him is they give him all sorts of things because um, for the asthma, uh, believe it or not, they have him smoke a cigar, drink coffee, smoke marijuana, um, opium, anything to try and stop the spasms. Um, but his father got so desperate that, and they would take him off to, you know, spas, water, you know, the waters, uh, to the beach, anywhere they thought maybe his lungs could take in the air. Um, it, it really was like drowning for him. It was that severe. So th then what his father started to do is at night in Manhattan, he would take out the carriage with the horses, have Teddy Roosevelt hang off the side and open his mouth and go as fast as he could, forcing air down into his lungs. So a, a primitive ventilator, right? And um, and you know, and, and so you know, they were very frustrated because they they you know they kept having doctors come in and nobody could do anything for them. And finally, finally, um, there was a guy named Doctor Salter who who basically said, and this wasn't true, but this is what made his father kind of make this connection. He said, you know, asthma is something that is in your mind. It's the fault of the the patient, which of course is horrible because it's made it seem like everybody's doing it to themselves. But it made Teddy Roosevelt's father say to, to TR, listen, you have the mind, but not the body. And without the body, the mind cannot go far. So you got to build yourself up. Now, this is at a time when um, people didn't exercise. In fact, they thought people who exercised were strange. You sure didn't exercise if you're in the 1%, the 400 richest families in America. Um, and you know, this concept that, you know, exercise is good for you it was really strange. And so, but knowing all that, they got with well, the equivalent of a personal trainer for the Victorian set. And they would come over and Teddy Roosevelt learned to box. He had parallel bars and he started to build his body up and, and he got better. You know, he started to get better. So this began a sort of lifelong obsession with the physical life. Because literally he had the fight to breathe, which really informs Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt all about action. The one reason he's all about action is because it took action for him just to breathe. So, you know, overcoming this, and, you know, even as a young man, he became, you know, he, went up, he was homeschooled up to Harvard. And then when he went off to begin an assemblyman, assemblyman in Albany, he was a very skinny little guy still. And um, so, so this is not the Teddy Roosevelt we know. This is really who, who he was at this point. And it's very impressive how he was able, like you said, to become so active with all these medical issues to help build up that stamina and, and, and help him get better. It's just incredible to read about what he went through in order to do that. Um, now, obviously, we just talked about some of the physical issues. Um, and you did mention some of the heartache he went through um, with his father, who he was very close with passing away. And then, of course, as you said, his mother and wife dying on the same day. And he left shortly after this happened and, and decided to head out west. Why do you think he decided to do this? OK, uh, great question. Well, you know, it's just a, a number of things. Um, at this time. There is a guy named Dr. Beardsley, and all these people were getting sick. They were getting cancer, heart disease, um, who were working in the cities. And Beardsley came, he's like, what's going on? And so he came up with this theory where he basically said, listen, this is, this is not good for people. It's not good for people to be indoors. People should labor under God's light. And he called it neurasthenia. And neurasthenia basically means nervous disease. Today we call it stress. Um, and so what he said was, you know, the active life, the people out west, the people that are, um, uh, you know, the farmers, that's the way we're supposed to be. This, this life of indoors and working offices, this isn't, this isn't what we're supposed to be. So this was sort of floating around in Manhattan at the time. Also, because Teddy Roosevelt was so sick, he also read lots of novels. 
And a lot of them had to do with the West. The West was being already commercialized on. Um, the West would be declared closed, just to sort of frame it for everybody. Um, the West would be closed in 1890. Uh, the, uh, you know, the frontier would be declared closed. And Frederick Jackson Turner's um, you know, theory of the West uh, basically said that America was gonna have a real problem because our rugged individualism was now gonna be capped. And, and what would this do to democracy? So really the wild west as we know it is really from 1865 to 1890. That's kind of, it's a very short period. So anyway, TR had actually gone out west once before he got married. Um, and he went out there to get a buffalo, um, you know, sort of a young, wealthy, wealthy man's sojourn. So he goes out there and of course he can't find one. It's almost impossible because all the buffalo have been killed by all the Indians and have been shot by all these people from train platforms. But he keeps going out, keeps going out with this guy named Joe Ferris, who who's, thinks that, you know, this four eyed. Uh, also, we should talk about his vision. He can't see. Teddy Roosevelt is like the four eyed cowboy. He can't see at all. So, you know, he shows up in like this dude with, you know, his Brooks Brothers sort of attire, you know, his buckskin coat and his, you know, pearl handled uh, revolver. And people think he's a joke. You know, so this is his first trip out there. And Joe Ferris thinks he's going to go right back to Manhattan, but he doesn't. He keeps going to Joe Ferris. Let's go out. And it's raining. And Joe Ferris is like, no, no, no. He's like, no, I can't wait to get a buffalo. So they chase this buffalo all over the place. Uh, you know, there's one called a lonesome George. It's like a straggler. And they lose. Uh, they, they get so far out there that, you know, they have to bed down for the night. It's, all of a sudden, a big lightning storm. Because This is in the Badlands. So the, the weather's awful. And so lightning rain they're laying out in the open and joe ferris hears teddy roosevelt go by jove this is fun you know so he realizes then that you know this guy is very different and he's thinking well, what's a jove you know and um so you know finally finally he gets this buffalo head this 35 pound buffalo head and, and takes it back on the train all right so this is before he's married so then alice lee who is the love of his life now he's in albany and He's an assemblyman. He, he gets a telegram and it says, um, your wife's having a baby. Everything's fine. He gets a second telegram saying, come home immediately. He comes home. Not only is his wife very ill, but his mother, Mitty, is very ill. His wife is dying from Bright's disease, which is a, a kidney disease that women at that time got. Um, it would kill Woodrow Wilson's wife as well. Um, his mother's dying from typhoid fever on the same day. So he's literally running up and down, up and down. And then he puts into, um, you know, his his mother dies first and then his wife dies second. A lot of people thought, you know, Teddy Roosevelt was going to lose his mind. He tries to go back to work. In his diary, he puts simply, the light has gone out of my life with a big X. And then, then you know, his political career kind of just tanks. And he gets on a train and leaves and goes back west to the Badlands, where he's actually invested in a, in a ranch out there, which, again, there's a whole story into that where he just plunked down $15,000 on a log, gave it to two guys he didn't know and bought a bunch of cattle. So, But that's Teddy Roosevelt. So he goes out there with no return date, saying, my life is over as I know. It. By the way, he has a daughter, uh, Alice, who he gives to his sister, Bammy, and says, you know, take her. Take her, which, you know, in hindsight, you say it was really awful, but this is what he did. And and he just goes out there into the Badlands, uh, which Custer called, you know, hell with the fires out. Um, it's just, you know, it's brutal. It's 120 degrees in the summer, 30 below in the winter. Um, and it's a place people go to disappear, die, or run from the law, you know. And Teddy Roosevelt gets out there, and he's like, this is amazing. Why? Because it sort of mirrors where he is existentially. You know, this just awful place he's he's fascinated with. And he's, um, you know, there's what's called lignite fires in, in the distance. They It's basically, it's uh, sort of a gas. It's from a volcanic gas coming out to catch its fire out there. So, so imagine sort of Dante's hell out there, you know, in the night where you see these blue lights off in the distance. And, you know, there's the Indians, the outlaws. I mean, 
Geronimo is still out there. Billy the Kid was just killed two years before. Um, but there's still a lot of Indian atrocities. It's it's a very rough place. And, you know, he gets off the train in the middle of the night and he's basically there. Yeah, that it I love that you chose this topic because it is not really known that he went out there. He be, I didn't know he was a cattle rancher. I mean, that he spent all this time doing that. So it's it's a really fascinating aspect of his life. And it's really funny that you mentioned the glasses because I was going to ask this later on, but since you just brought it up, I'm going to dive into it a little bit sooner. But the glasses thing comes up a lot throughout your book. And it's really funny because I started to almost look for it and anticipate it. And it really does become sort of a symbol of, you know, these men, these cowboys out in the West, they wouldn't be caught dead in glasses, even if they couldn't see straight. And it sort of reminds me that a lot of people judged him based on his appearance, especially with these glasses. And then he always ended up surprising them, whether that was, you know, being really excited to be up for 36 hours drenched in the rain or diving into a river on a horse to cross over. So can you talk a little bit about how yeah. he was judged by people and and sort of talk about that? Yeah, so you're talking about a guy who's coming out there all outfitted with these, I mean, Coke bottle glasses. He was blind as a bat. And, uh, and he talked strangely. Teddy Roosevelt, you know, I've heard recordings of his voice. He had a high-pitched voice, and that was from his asthma. And um, he also had the patrician accent of the upper class. So he would say things like to other cowboys when they're like, you know, out on the range, hasten forward quickly there. And they'd be like, what? Hasten forward quickly there? You know, so I mean, you know, he just, he was everything they thought. And here's this dude, this guy. But, but here's the thing. He was small and sort of almost sickly. Uh, one woman said you could span his waist with two hands. Um, but he does quickly start, you know, and in the West, your word is everything and, and whether you can back up what you say. So so what happens to Teddy Roosevelt? Well, the first thing that happens to him, he's out looking for some horses and it gets late. So he goes to a place called Mingusville, which is this dirty little town. And, uh, you know, we always have the gunfighter thing in our head with the West. Well, Teddy goes into this hotel to look for a place to stay and there's a guy who's shooting the place off and Roosevelt goes and sits down behind a, a stove thinking well maybe he'll just leave but the guy comes over with the guns out and hangs over him and says four eyes the glasses is buying around for the house and you know Teddy sort of ignores him and he says again he says four eyes is buying around for the house now Teddy Roosevelt had um become a boxer he, he that's one of the things he did to build himself up he boxed in college so he knew how to box so this guy's hanging so Roosevelt goes well if I have to I have to so he stands up cold cocks him with the right and with the left and knocks him out and they hustle this guy out and this goes all over the place this begins the sort of thought of well maybe he isn't what we thought he was you know this guy can kind of back himself up um, and this would happen continually. Um, there was once a Texan who was ribbing him about his glasses. And and finally, Roosevelt said, put up a shut up fight or be friends. And this big Texan, you know, said, okay, friends. You know, so, I mean, he would he would back it up. They, they saw that, as they put it, he had sand in his craw and that, you know, he, he, he could rub himself. But, I mean, you're supposed to, in the West, you're supposed to be a great shot. Um, you know, you're supposed to be able to lasso. I mean, he was not a great shot because of these glasses. Um, and, you know, just to demythologize the West a little, most people weren't great shots. Um, first of all, bullets were expensive and cowboys were always broke. Um, they weren't out there plunking cans. Uh, they had Colt 45s, which are, I've shot them before. They're really hard to hit anything with. And two, they didn't have smokeless powder. So all the smoke would go up when you shot them off. So a lot of times when these gunfights would break out, everything else would be shot up but the people, you know. So this was sort of, you know, th this was more the real West. And and this is what, you know, Roosevelt came into. And, and um, but he, he, he did start to develop this reputation as being, you know, a fairly tough guy. And let me just tell you another little vignette. Um, 
let's let's call this sort of the the bucket list of the Wild West because Roosevelt did just about everything he could do in the West. Um, so he's out again looking for horses, and Indians come up on him. Now, what's the state of the Indian cowboy relationship? It's not good. There's still atrocities committed on both sides, really heinous things. So I couldn't even say on here. And um, uh, and so, you know, f- four or five Indians come riding up on him with their Winchesters out. And Roosevelt gets off his horse, puts his rifle over the pommel of his saddle, as, and the Indians stop. And, you know, he's like, stay right there. And they're like, well, we're friendly Indians. And he's like, no, no, stay right there. And they keep coming up on him. And so Roosevelt said later that he aimed for the center Indian. He said, if they were going to kill me, I was going to take him with me. So he had to know him. And so they stop again, and, and one of them tries to hold up an old reservation uh, sort of thing, uh, pass or something. But Roosevelt says, no, 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 no. And then he said that uh, suddenly he knew their English was very good because he started to curse at him. And so then, you know, uh, he, you know, they, they kind of backed off and, and he got back on his horse and they followed him for a while, but he got away. So, I mean, and again, this became part of the legend of Teddy Roosevelt, you know, it's another thing where, you know, and, and he said, he said, later, he goes, you know, I figured they'd kill me, but I, I'd take a few with them with me. So, you know, Teddy Roosevelt's interested because in the time he's out there in 1883, 1884, he has one foot in modernity, you know, one foot in the world as it is, and one foot in this mythical Wild West, which he lived in his mind as a boy, and now he's there. Now, there's another thing, too, you should know, is that um, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show at the time, when Roosevelt was a boy, was making the rounds, and he went to it. And it was just, you know, what it was is, well, Buffalo Bill was this guy from the West who thought I could make some money on this, came and created a whole show, hired a bunch of Indians, and then would go around and tour. And so basically in the Wild West show, um, Buffalo Bill was a savior. He would always come in and save, you know, everybody from the Indians, you know, the big white savior kind of thing. And um, and again, it sort of played into what we talked about for that Neurasthenia thing, where, you know, people would go see Buffalo Bill and think, that's the real American. That's the real American. You know, these, these city dwellers, that's not it. That's the real American. And Teddy Roosevelt bought into that. He thought, you know, the act, the act of life is the only worth life worth living. And that has a genesis out West. Now you, you talk about, you know, Native Americans. Would you say that his views on them evolved over his lifetime from, you know, maybe his time in the Badlands to the end of his life, or did they stay pretty consistent? Well, you know, he famously said things like only Indians are good, you know, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Um, but, you know, this is over time. And, um, you know, he was really destined to sort of cross paths because even there's a famous photo, and probably some of our listeners, viewers know this. Um, there's a famous photo that was taken in 1865 of a parade was uh, going down the middle Manhattan with Red Cloud in it, the Indian warrior. And um, in the 1950s, a historian was looking at this photo and he saw two little faces in a window. And he did some research and sure enough, that was Teddy Roosevelt and his brother, you know, staying there, and they were in their uncle's house. And, and you know, they, they saw it was, it was Lincoln's funeral actually in this parade and these, these Indians were following. So at a very early age, he, he sort of crossed the, 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 you know, the Indians, if you will. Um, and then, you know, when he was out West, he was very egalitarian with the ones that he bumped into. Um, I think later in the campaign trail and such, you know, he would rip off with some of these one liners that have been held up in history and say, aha, you know, see, he was a racist against Indians, but, um, you know, did he evolve? I think he evolved somewhat, you know, and, you know, it's, it's hard to say, really. Right. Well, in your book, you also call this time sort of the romantic era of exploration. And do you think his time in the Badlands, as you said, you know, many adventures he has during this time, do you think that it gives him that desire 
for adventure and travel. We know later he goes to Africa. He goes down the river of doubt. Do you think his time out West sort of sparked that in him? Yes. Um, he had, he had a thing where he said, when he went West, he said, black care rarely sits on the rider who rides fast enough. So what does that mean? That means that the, his severe grief that he was feeling over the death of his wife, who, by the way, he would never let anybody ever mention her name to him again. She was, he'd walled her up. But that the severe grief could only be overcome through action, incredible action. And in his entire life, he will do this, where he will, um, you know, a hardship will occur, and then he'll go on a safari or go down the, you know, the Amazon or something. And and this is this is one of the things that drove him to go um, out west was this life action. Now, also, we talked about him being sick. He's writing letters back to his sister saying, "You know what? I feel great. I'm sleeping well. I'm eating a lot. Uh, I feel strong." And these are things that he didn't say before. So the West is having a transformation now. We have a hard time in the year 2022 of thinking about remaking ourselves. But in the, the 19th century, you could do that by going west. You know, the, the west was a function of the Louisiana Purchase, where it doubled the size of the country, right? Jefferson bought it from France. And, and so you had this huge space. But guess what? We couldn't control it. We had no police. We had no churches out there. We had nothing. So what do we come up with? Manifest destiny, which is basically God ordained us to settle the continent from ocean to ocean and go west, young man. That was actually from an editorial, a Tara Hote uh, ed editorial writer wrote. He said, go west, young man, go west. So this is a very strong uh, sort of charge for Americans. So like, let's say you're working in New York and you're working for somebody and you, you're getting nowhere. Guess what? You could go west. And if you could survive, you'd go out and claim a bunch of land as your own. And that would um, give you a stake. And you could remake yourself. You could change your name. And that's what Teddy Roosevelt did. He went out west to remake himself, to transform himself from this sickly guy with this horrible tragedy into something else. He didn't know what yet. But he was evolving as he did it. And one of the things he did, that's sort of talking about the, the the adventure, is he went hunting for a grizzly bear out there. Because, you know, again, Teddy Roosevelt says, got to go hunting. So he goes hunting for a grizzly bear with this guy. And this guy's like, you know, they can't find anything, can't find anything. And by the way, grizzly bear is not a black bear. Black bears are not that bad. Grizzly bears are man eaters. So... They're looking and looking and looking. And finally, they leave out, you know, a carcass so they can kind of pull in the grizzly bear. Well, then they see that somebody's, you know, something's eating the carcass. And so they know they're close. So they were wearing moccasins. They're creeping up. And this guy says to Teddy Roosevelt, hold up, hold back. And Roosevelt, of course, walks forward. And this grizzly bear just rears up 10 feet in front of him. And this is a guy who can't see well. And he pulls up his his rifle and shoots him right between the eyes. It was either him or that bear. The bear is going to kill him or he's going to kill the bear. So he kills the bear. And he said later, I was a little green because I knew, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if this, this was it. Right. So after he, they kill the grizzly bear, um, they have a wagon and they're, they're a long ways out from the ranch. And Teddy Roosevelt says, you know, what? I'm going to ride back by myself. And he does. And he writes about this later. And he gallops across the west and you can see he passes indians it's a, he said it's a clear night the moon's out and you can see these lignite fires in the distance and he realizes that you know he's 25 26 that he's having the adventure of his life that he will never ever have this again and so he has a sort of second vision where he realizes this is a great thing that he's doing and of course jumping ahead when he finally does leave the West, he said, this was, I knew this would be the happiest time of my life, you know, when he, when he leaves it finally. But, but, you know, so, so it fits into that sort of age of exploration where, you know, you, you can go off and do these things. And you, there was these vast areas of the country that were still open unexplored, which was the Badlands. Um, and, and if you could survive, 
then you can have these incredible experiences and remake yourself. Now, connecting to that, before I ask, I have a couple more questions and then we'll get into a Q&A. So for those of you who are watching, if you do have questions, make sure you go into the ask a question and type them up. Um, but I do want to ask a couple more before we have you read a passage and then get to our audience questions. But you touched on this throughout. And I know you mentioned in the book that this was the sort of stress and anxiety was called over much thought. And that because of this tragedy, he's really, really struggling. And throughout the book, he's also telling people, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know if I'm going to make it. And he want, he has to stay constantly busy, constantly active so that his mind doesn't focus on this tragedy and he doesn't sort of drive himself crazy. And that's why he's so busy all the time. He wants to completely stay occupied. Um, what his time in the Badlands, sort of dealing with this grief, having these adventures, you call your book Forging a President. What attributes do you think were formed while he was spending his time in the Badlands that oh. later helped him as president? Yeah. Um, you know, really, he became the... All right, so Teddy Roosevelt became president, I think, like 1901. Um, or, or you know, like 1903 when McKinley was assassinated. And so the country's just beginning and, and Roosevelt is taking over this country and he immediately coins the phrase, speak softly but carry a big stick, which is a very Western thing. You know, you didn't run things out. Cowboy, you know, I'm gonna veer a little bit. Cowboys were, were a very egalitarian experience for Roosevelt. He had never bumped into the common man. And so now he's out on roundups. And by the way, these roundups were extremely dangerous. And they'd be, you know, these stampedes would occur in the middle of the night and he would literally go off a cliff with his horse. Horse would flip over. He ended up in the Little Missouri River. Then he'd get back on and keep galloping for 40 hours. Um, fate is definitely a factor. Roosevelt should have been killed so many times out west. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, but, you know, these experiences and being with these cowboys, like you said, he would talk to me and say, I'm never going back. I, this is my life now. And they were very pressing it because a couple of them said, no, you, one day you'll get tired of running cattle and you'll go back. And one day you'll be president, which is amazing. Somebody would say that to him, you know. Right. And Teddy Roosevelt would later say, you know, uh, going west was the romance of my life. And the second thing he said was, I could have never been president without going west. So why do you say that? Well, because as president, in, he developed you know, the ethos of you stand by what you say um, and, and that you, you don't back down. Um, and of course, we'll see this many times in his presidency when he has to confront you know, the trust or, or w whatever comes in front of him. And even sending the great white fleet around, which was, um, you know, a big deal to send this white fleet all over the world and say, we've arrived as a country. I mean, Roosevelt was a perfect president at the time because that cowboy swagger came into play when America was trying to push into the world as a superpower, which was a term they wouldn't have used then, but as a major power, you know? And, and so you wanted that cowboy president to come, to come along and, and take, take charge and point America in a certain way. Um, and, you know, he it just, you know, an aside, he always said that any the cowboys that he rode with as a rough rider or he knew out there could drop in to the White House at any time. And they did. <laughs> he would be in the middle of a meeting and they'd be like, so and so's outside. Who was this? Some cowboy. Like, OK, stop. And he'd go out and see him and have him come in. And Roosevelt famously rode a horse to work a lot of times. He 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 told you know his cabinet member, let's go swimming. And they're like, what are you talking about? We're going to the Potomac. It's the winter. You need to strip down. And they'd all go, have to go swimming with him. Um, again, you know, over much thought is we would call it depression today or stress. Um, action. Action was always preeminent. And so, you know, because he did suffer from depression. There is no doubt about it. And he would have to deal with his whole life. But it was always the action taken that mattered most. And that's a very uh, Western thought. So the West, gig, I think, grounded him. Uh, I think the West remade him. And by the way, when he came back from the West, 
he bumped into Edith Carroll, who was an old flame from his early days. And she didn't recognize him. She was, who is this guy with this big handlebar mustache, this burly chest, this big neck, sunburned with his scar down the side of his face because a horse had thrown him. And he's like, it's Teddy Roosevelt. Well, so they get engaged. And just, just to throw this in, Teddy Roosevelt was not a good businessman. He put the equivalent of probably a million dollars today into his ranch. In 1887 came the winter of blue snow, which was the worst snow, snow storm winter ever. And it wiped out his almost his entire herd. And he was coming back in because Edith Carroll's like, I am not going west. And so he knew it was going to come to an end anyway, but he lost a ton of money out there. And by the way, the Roosevelt's didn't have that much money. They had a fair amount, but not enough to keep doing things like that. So it was a blow in a way. But, you know, again, he came back from the West as this transformed person who physically, and they even said his, you know, one gentleman said his voice had changed. He had this sort of high pitched voice, and now it was a, a deeper voice, more measured. Um, you know, he had lived this life of three years out in the West, and the West had transformed him. Yeah, I love that because he's going back and forth as well over the years from the West to the East, that he really later considered himself a Westerner. And yes. so I think that later too, as president, he gets just a sense of people across this country. Uh, so that I thought was very interesting too. Um, but to wrap up my last question, um, you mentioned towards the end of a book that TR had said to a senator that if he was forced to pick one part of his life to remember, it would be his time on the ranch. Why do you think he would choose that time period out of everything? Um, I think because one, like we talked about, it was fortune, but also two, it was a, a very balanced, supremely happy time for him in terms of Teddy Roosevelt was a big reader writer. He were, he was the most literate president we ever had. He literally wrote, you know, I think 15 books and he wrote three or four books based on the West and he wrote them while he was out there too. So his days would consist of going on the roundup, riding for 15 hours in the saddle, this, this hard, hard life, coming back to his ranch, having a big meal and then sitting down to read on his porch or write. And, you know, Roosevelt wasn't sure he was going to be a politician. He thought about being a literary man. You know, he thought about being a writer, an author. Uh, but I can tell you as a writer, if you could have that sort of balance where you have this physical life and this literary life, that's a great life. But I think, too, he probably says his time out ranch because, you know, it's not like today. He wasn't in contact with anybody when he was out there. He was out there in the West living among uh Men that you know kind of lived by their wits, lived on a lived on a you know horse, and and that is very Roosevelt. You know he he's also a naturalist. You know we didn't cover this, but Roosevelt is a naturalist. He knows flora and fauna. He knows the trees. He he you know he he thought about being a naturalist. He he really thought that was, but Alice Lee didn't want him to do that, so he backed off on that. So I think it brought a lot of things together, and he was young. He was living a young man's adventure. So why wouldn't you say that's the happiest time? You know, it makes sense. Well, thank you so much. I know you're going to um, oh. read a passage from your book, which I'm very yeah. excited about. I highly encourage all of you uh, to purchase a copy of this book from our gift shop. The link is in the chat. Um, and I'll leave you with a little teaser. One of my favorite parts of the book, one of my favorite stories is when he is after these thieves and he's sitting in a boat and he's reading Anna Karenina, I believe. Yes. While he's on, while he's hunting for these thieves. And it just made me laugh thinking about these men on the hunt and Teddy Roosevelt sitting there with a book cracked open, you know, trying enjoying his reading. So if you want to hear more about that story and a lot of really intriguing near-death experiences and adventure and how he deals with the tragedy we've mentioned definitely um, pick this up. So with that, thank you, William. And I'll leave it to you to, to read uh, a little passage from your book. Yeah, this is the very, this is very, and actually it's Teddy Roosevelt's words because he, he really is probably the best authority on his time out there. 
So he's writing this and he's looking back at his time out there. It was still the Wild West in those days, the Far West, the West of Owen Wister's stories and Frederick Remington's drawings, the West of the Indian and the Buffalo Hunter, the Soldier and the Cowpuncher. That land of the West is gone now, gone, gone with lost Atlantis, gone to the Isle of Ghosts and of strange dead memories. It's a land of vast silent spaces of lonely rivers and of plains where the wild game stared at the passing horsemen. It was a land of scattered ranchers, of herds of longhorn cattle, and of reckless riders who unmoved looked in the eyes of life or of death. In that land, we led a free and hardy life with horse and with rifle. We worked under the scorching midsummer sun when the wide plain shimmered and wavered in the heat. And we knew the freezing misery of riding night guard around cattle in the late fall roundup. In the soft springtime, the stars were glorious in our eyes each night before we fell asleep. And in winter, we rode through the blinding blizzards when the driven snow dust burnt our faces. They were monotonous days as we guided the trail cattle or the beef herds, hour after hour at the slowest of walks, in minutes or hours teeming with excitement as we stopped stampedes or swam the herds across rivers, treacherous with quicksands or brimmed with running ice. We knew toil and hardship and hunger and thirst, and we saw men die violent deaths as they worked among the horses and the cattle or fought in evil feuds with one another. But we felt the beat of hearty life in our veins, and ours was the glory of work and the joy of living. And that's Teddy Roosevelt. Wow. Very well said. Wow. I had no idea. I just have to tell you, I have learned so much and I cannot wait to finish reading this book now. Um, thank you both so much, uh, William, for, for being here and Mallory for your, as always, excellent preparation and great, great questions and a great conversation. We do have some audience questions. Um, I'm going to invoke host privilege as sometimes I do though and sure. ask um, a, a leading question. And I see that um, James in our audience has, has said we could use another TR as president today. Hey, can there ever be another Teddy Roosevelt? Given the way we live, the way people come up through the system, could there ever be another president like him? Well, that's a good question. I mean, because uh, T.R. always did what he thought was right, even if there was big, big pay penalties. Um, you know, he had uh, Booker T. Washington, um, a black man, to the White House in 1902 for dinner. And Booker T. Washington was, you know, Tuskegee, Tuskegee Institute and very renowned. And he had him over and nobody had ever done this before. Nobody ever had a, a African-American for dinner. And next day he was crucified for it. He, oh, no. uh, he ended up with just, you know, the, the, the South lambasted him. Everybody thought his, his political career was over. And Teddy Roosevelt said, you know what? I'll have over anybody I want to have over for dinner. You know, and so, you know, I took a lot of guts. And when he took on J.P. Morgan and the trust, you know, people are like, don't do it. Don't do it. You know, he'll destroy you. And he did it. You know, so can somebody like that? I think so. I think so. I think, you know, it's going to be a fight, but I think so. Well, that's a hopeful and uh, positive answer. Thank you. Um, uh, well, James and three others want to know, are you hearing an echo of me? Um, a teeny bit. Okay. I hope it's not distracting. Maybe Jacques will let me know because I don't know where that came from. Um, and if you could both just double check that you don't have me open in two places um, while I continue to ask. Um, James, James says, does William have an opinion of the recent removal of TR statue from New York City's Museum of Natural History? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, again, you know, going back, I'll, I'll just give you two, two instances. We have the Booker T. Washington, you know, where he had the, um, he, you know, he had him over for dinner and he clearly said, you know, I don't go for that. And then he also, his own Harvard thesis, he said women should uh, be equal to men, they should have the vote, and they shouldn't have to change their name. Uh, this doesn't sound to me like a guy who's entrenched in, you know, bigotry and racism. Um, 
Now, is he of his time? Yeah. yeah. But I think you get in real tr trouble when you start going back and moralizing <laughs> and, go, and go and go and apply the you know the mores of 2022 to something like 1900. You're going to find that you know yes, there's yeah. different views. Um, so, so you know, I, I think we're at a time in history where a lot of mythology is being torn down, a lot of statues are being torn down, things like that. Um, and I think probably TR's statue, I think it was moved in New York, wasn't it, to another location or something like that? Um, but, you know, you got to be careful because imagine what they'll say about us. Thank you for that. So um, for some reason, now that I have come up on, um, on screen, we're hearing an echo, and I apologize to our audience for that. Uh, Mallory, would you be able to manage the rest of the Q&A, please, and let me go off screen again? Um, I think that might help with the problem. Sure. Great. Thank you. And I'll pop back on to say goodbye at the end. But, but thank you. All right. So continuing, uh, let's see. We have a question from Val. She said, you mentioned the buffalo were killed by Indians. Didn't white settlers kill buffalo to weaken Native Americans and destroy their ability to survive? Thanks Absolutely. Well, the government put a bounty on the heads of the buffaloes where they said, you kill X amount of buffalo, you get X amount of money. Um, they also offered the Indians the same thing. So the Indians went there and just killed them like crazy, as well as the, 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 you know, the settlers. Um, because, as you said, they realized that without the buffalo, these nomadic tribes were going to die off. And they did. You know, they just slaughtered all these buffalo. And that's why when, by the time Teddy Roosevelt went out there in 1883 to look for a, a buffalo, it was very hard to find one, which is kind of amazing. That in 1883, they were pretty much gone, but they were. And, um, you know, and again, the railroad, the railroads would take a rail car out there. Uh, people from the east would hire on hire somebody to take them out there, and they literally wouldn't get off the rail car. They'd shoot the buffalo from the rail car, you know. So yeah, the buffalo were toast. <laughs> uh, Judy would like to know: Did you consult Mornings on a Horseback by David McCullough? You know, I I think I did read that. Um, I used a lot of. Roosevelt's own books and diaries, and he was such a literate man. He left behind so much that it was really a great thing. And he wrote so much about the West. He wrote a, a three volume uh, tome or big, big, you know, tomes uh, called Winning the West. So, you know, there was so much there. And uh, I did, I think I did read McCullough's book. You know, what I try and do is I try and read as many books as I can. And then, you know, if, if you can get your hands on primary sources, which are diaries and um, newspaper articles are great. I use a lot of those. Um, and then you try and pick out, you know, something, oh, maybe McCullough discovered this or that. But McCullough is, uh, was really great in de describing the way he conducted himself when he was president, which was really pretty fascinating, you know, and very much the cowboy still. Very much a cowboy. Great. All right, moving right along. Uh, Irene would like to know what connection was there between his time in the West and his Spanish American War experiences? Well, great question. Um, okay, so the war in Spain's 1898, and he, you know, he leaves uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy and goes out there. Um, you know, Teddy Roosevelt. <sighs> His father hired a substitute in the Civil War and didn't go. And he idolized his father, but it's the one thing he did that he didn't quite understand. So he believed a man's finest hour was in the war, for good or bad. And so when the Spanish-American War broke out, which, by the way, he pretty much instituted, instigated in a lot of, that's a whole nother book, um, he's like, I'm going. And so he forms up the Rough Riders. Well, who are the Rough Riders? There are a lot of the cowboys he knew from his time out west. And all these guys were like, yeah, we'll go with Teddy. And so they all join up. At the same time, he also got a lot of blue bloods out of England, or rather out of New York. So he had a lot of guys from Harvard and Princeton and stuff too. But the bulk of it were these cowboys from the west. And so, you know, 
they could ride, they could shoot, you know. And so they all went down to Texas to train a little, and that was about it. And then they went off to Cuba and charged up San Juan Hill and won the war, which is crazy, but that's how it happened. And um, and just so you know, um, I'm working on a book now called um, The Last Charge of the Rough Rider, which is the last days of Teddy Roosevelt. When he wanted to reorganize, and I mean, he got very close, reorganize the Rough Riders and go over and fight the Germans. And I mean, it's he had Congress pass a, a law. It's there's a whole thing to it. And all those guys that he knew from out West that are now like in their 50s and 60s, they're like, yeah, we're going. They're all like, <laughs> you know, signing up. They're like, we're going. And so, you know, so really uh, his time out West created the Rough Riders. Amazing. I can't wait for that for that next book. Yeah, it's a pretty cool book. Very interesting. Uh, so our dear friend, John Pascal would like to know, how did Roosevelt view Mark Twain and vice versa? So I don't know if you want to tackle that first or I could. Um, okay, well, I'll give you, because uh, actually I stumbled onto this a little bit. So he just said, how did he view Mark Twain and vice versa? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, wow. um, I don't know a lot about that relationship, but in some of my research recently, um, after Booker T. Washington um, had dinner, and after the whole South blew up, and I mean blew up over this, you, the headlines, I can't even say them on our Zoom, um, and Roosevelt had to go down for a... Um, ceremony somewhere i think down south a little bit anyway i think twain was there and um twain said of roosevelt's dinner you know he really should you know quit doing things that put him in that puts him in the paper as if this was sort of a publicity stunt this coming from a guy who wears a white suit all the time, but, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, okay. I'm like, really? Okay. Really? You know, sure. Uh, so my gut is, and you probably know more about this than I do. My gut is they weren't overly fond of each other, but I don't think they, it ever came to the open, but you, you can fill it in the blanks. Yeah. He, it, it's very interesting how Twain or Sam Clemens uh, views Teddy Roosevelt because he absolutely hated him as president, just hated him. And a lot of that was because Twain was a staunch anti-imperialist. He was vice president of the anti-imperialist league. Okay. Well, there you go. He really disagreed uh, with Roosevelt uh, on that topic. Um, he called him the Tom Sawyer of the political world of the 20th century. Um, and he said that Roosevelt was the most formidable disaster that had befallen the country since the Civil War. I so think I saw that one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was not a fan of him as president. But what's really interesting is on a personal level, he really loved Roosevelt and wrote glowingly about him, just that he loved to dine with him and they had great conversation. And so socially, he loved Roosevelt. And you would think, you know, that they're best friends. But just politically and Roosevelt as president, Twain could not stand him. Um, and I know that Roosevelt was a fan of Twain's writing. Uh, he carried Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn with him when he was going through Africa. Um, and we talked about, you know, Roosevelt being an avid reader. So Twain definitely was among, uh, amongst that. Uh, but yeah, Twain, Twain was not a fan of, of him as president, but fan of him as a person. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, also, too, if I, if I had to just make some observations, Roosevelt understood publicity very well. And so did Twain, you know, they understood the power of being in the papers and such. And Roosevelt liked courting the press. And, you know, he, he was a big footprint kind of guy. So I could see with, you know, Sam Clemens kind of being like, eh, you know, on that too, you know, but I, I, you know, and also too, I'll just jump over to what you were talking about before. Roosevelt always had a book going. He was always reading. Even when people come and see him in the Oval Office, he would be reading while they were talking to him, which would drive people crazy. And then, of course, you brought up uh, 
when he turned in, I call it his, in the book, I call it his Sheriff Roosevelt chapter, where he had a boat stolen from him. They took it down the little Missouri River. Anybody else would be like, oh, forget the boat. Roosevelt's like, no, we got to go get the boat. And he takes two guys with him and chases the bad guys down. And that's when he takes Anna Karenna with him and with and a bunch of buffalo robes, sits in the middle of the boat while they're going. And I mean, it's cold out. It's like zero. Sits in the middle of the boat on the buffalo robes, reading Anna Karenna going down the little Missouri River in the, in, in the Badlands in the middle of winter after some bad guys. And, of course, when he gets the bad guys, everybody's like, well, just shoot them. And Roosevelt's like, no, no, they got to be taken to justice. And so then he ends up like in this 70 mile odyssey, having to escort these guys, him walking, them riding all the way to this town, gives them to a sheriff where he gets 35 bucks. And the sheriff's like, why didn't you just shoot him? And he's like, I wanted to bring him into justice, you know, and he just, he'd gone through hell to do this. But that was Roosevelt. Well, we're going to wrap up. I'm going to ask, ask one final question. And it's just because I'm intrigued by this. I did not realize he wrote as many books as he did. The passage you read was beautiful. Love the description. But I've never read anything by him. How would you judge him as a writer? Should we be um, going out and, and buying books by Teddy Roosevelt? Or should we hold off a little bit? Well, you know, he... he um. He wrote in a post-Victorian style, which means there's a lot of purple prose, you know, um, which, you know, for the 19th, early 20th century was fine. He would tend to overwrite. He wasn't a natural writer. He had to work very hard to write. And he talks about this a lot. And what's great, though, is because it was the late 19th century, early 20th century, he could go off on these long riffs on sentences and describe things that, you know, today would be like, uh, you know, Hemingway's, you know, 20 years, 30, 20, 30 years off. So less is more. It's not coming yet. So, you know, he would have, you know, very Victorian riffs of purple prose that is very poetic and, and very overdone at times. So, and he's a very, erudite man he's immensely educated so he would tend to pile on so when you're reading it you know to the 20th 21st century mind you know it can get pretty hard to get through because it's just layered prose layered prose layered prose um but if you want to read about the west as it was then and we haven't talked about this but real quickly one reason he set aside all those millions of acres was because he said, nobody will be able to do what I've done. You know, the world will change by then. But he said, at least they can come out and see it. And that's why he set aside Yellowstone and the millions of, at a time when conservation wasn't even a term yet. He just set aside all that land. So if you go west to the Yellowstone, to the great parks, thank Teddy Roosevelt, because nobody else would have done that. He was the only guy I could do it because everybody else would have developed it, you know. But TR had this vision where he's like, you can't do what I did, but at least you can see it. Right. Well, with that being said, we are out of time. But thank you so much for joining us. Oh, here's Jennifer to, to wrap us up. Yes, and um, uh, hopefully I can do this without any interference. Thank you both so much. What a fascinating conversation. And again, I know I've learned so much and I know our audience has been just digging it. Uh, Jacques has posted the, the link once again for you to purchase your very own copy of Forging Your President. Um, and I can't imagine that uh, if you hadn't been inclined to do that before this program, that you're not inclined to do so now. William, um, you are one of our favorites. Please make sure to uh, not be a stranger and please come back when your next book is out and we'll have Mallory talk with you again about that one. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure that. always. And Mallory, thank you so much. Great job as always. Of course. And thank thanks you. to our audience for the great questions as always too. All right, good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night.